the how like athletes should perform exercises and periodize uh, the training sessions like what's your overall thought if you are a, if you were a football player a basketball player how would you plan your uh, sessions in, in season and off season well, that's a good question i mean first of all i'd need to speak to the player and find out what their typical season length is so using that football as an example if it's a four to six months in season playing okay you need to factor that in and then it might be maybe six to eight months where they're not actually playing but they still got to have their practice games and use that more as a base building block so you need to sort of establish over the entire length of the macro cycle are you factoring in just training to build their fitness and their strength as a base and then enhance it when they're playing or are you looking to get them to a peak before they start playing and then sustain that peak for as long as possible obviously this will vary and change depending on the sport you do like powerlifting you essentially work your what you wave your way up to a peak then you go for your meet and then you take a deload and you wave up to the next peak, which might be a mock meet or an open where you have, where you have to hit a certain total to then be considered for international comp and so on and so forth. Yes. So when it comes to more sports themselves, what I found with people that I work with is I'll tend to have a lot more of the hypertrophy style work and very sort of absolute strength work in the periods before they train to their off seasons. Because it means that they can get enough recovery and when they're actually playing and they're in their season it will be about maintaining the strength or what uh, Dan John and Pavel Satsulin have referred to in some of their books as easy strength. Um, there is a book actually called easy strength which goes into that where you're essentially trying to it's, it's what's called training on the nerve. Christian Savodi mentions it, it's training on the nerve so you're almost always ready to to go into sort of sport or to whatever you're doing. Yeah. Uh, that is something that people don't always consider. You have to, again, build up your base to be able to sustain that. And that's not the sort of thing that you would necessarily get somebody doing from day one. You'd have to work them in towards it. And that's where base building comes in. So it's understanding if you want to perform your best, it might take three, five years or more to actually build that up from a, just a general physical preparedness standpoint. That's without also taking into account your specialized physical preparedness, and everything that you need for your sport. Like being in football yourself, you know there's there's drills you have to have, there's certain plays you have to have, you have to understand how to move, where your lateral sort of positioning is going to come from. You've got to think, right, what stress is that putting on the body? How much of those skills do they need to work on? Will this training I'm doing fatigue those neural pathways to make their skills sloppy? So it's, yeah. It has to all be to wait to be weighed up. A lot of people talk about it being balance. It's not so much balance as it is spinning plates. I've found because okay, yeah. if you if you're a professional athlete as an example you've got somebody spinning your nutrition plate you've got somebody spinning your recovery plate because they'll have their foods done for them the massage is done and all the extra stuff the same as their programming and whatnot all they have to do is turn up and crack on yeah if you're an average person you might have you've got to do your own work you've got to do your own nutrition you've got to have your own recovery there's only so much resource to go around and this is where sometimes i've found that people will look at high level training and go, that's what I want to do. It's like, okay, great. However, this is not the place you're in. You're not here. You haven't got this support structure. And that's where mentally I find there's sometimes a bit of, um, a bit of dissonance. Everyone thinks they can train to be elite or they think they can follow the methods of the greats. And to be fair, some can. Some people are just amazing like that. The majority can't. Because, of because the they do not plan. understand the extra stress. Yeah, they need the recovery. They, they also don't have the same mental fortitude with it. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Say if you're doing drills, for example, and you've got to do half an hour of drills, right, of a specific drill. Some people will be like, yep, I'm just going to do this one drill and just keep doing it, doing it, doing it. Going around the cones, passing through, cutting over someone else and kicking towards top left corner, like whatever. They can keep doing that. And they will get sharper as they do it. Others do three of those and they're like, okay, I'm bored now. And their attention has wandered. Okay, yeah, got it. Perfect. So you've got to factor those in as well. Uh, yeah, um, as a like, semi-professional footballer, I found many channels on YouTube that talk about the importance of strength. And they say, you've got to do squat, uh, bench press and deadlift and that's it. And I mean, for me, it's kind of minimalistic and being a, in a sport like football that requires multi-directional um, movements 
and also you you put effort uh, like more in the quadriceps and adductors instead of the armstrings sometimes you you can't be minimalistic with your program you have to do like reverse nordic nordic uh, yeah. specific training for each specific muscle at least in the lower body what's your mm. thought about that now i would say that is that is very much fair enough because when it comes to getting the bigger movements in squat bench deadlift the classic moves they that they're not wrong i mean that is a good way to train that would be like a complete off-season block so say that might be the first three months of your off-season training okay. purely to build enough base of absolute strength so that going into nordic hamstring curls if somebody's got a good mind muscle connection from say deadlift romanian deadlift good mornings uh, things of that nature hip thrust glute bridges hip bridges yeah they can then use that base strength and then transfer it hopefully to the skill of a nordic hamstring curl now, obviously for Nordic hamstring curl, for people that are not aware, is where you'd have your feet locked in place with your calves and you essentially tip forwards and bring yourself back up purely on your hamstrings. Brilliant movement, but very hard. Now, lots of people have actually got the strength to do that. However, what they lack is the neurological skill. Yeah, they, they can't facilitate the muscles in the right order and have them firing in the correct way. There's all, again, there's exceptions to that. I've literally seen people just be able to do them they've never done them before and you're like that's amazing <laughs> however most people can't they need to learn into it i mean in reference to football um i'm sure there's a study i don't know if it was the nsca that did it or it was one of those sort of organizations where they looked at nordic hamstring curls and the instances of i think it was acl injuries in footballers yes, and found that yes. the stronger they were through hamstrings and because of the the, the need or inflection of it all and it's extension the Nordic hamstring will help prevent more injuries than it normally would and this is what people seem to forget when it comes to training for sport is yes you want to become strong in specific angles take the take the squat right so people say oh you need to squat to be good with football to help you well, yeah a full range of movement squat will help you in terms of health preventing injury potentially more muscle recruitment better mind muscle connection that kind of stuff however will it help force production for sprinting well a full range of movement squat maybe not because of the joint angles that you use when you actually sprint it's different it's probably going to get more from a quarter squat maybe a half squat or a trap bar deadlift because of momentum marks and those things and how the force generation is actually required it doesn't mean don't do full squats obviously do full squats you have to then look at how things are periodized in and that then goes into what's called uh, it was a russian term it's what's called specialized variety where you'd have like a program of training and what they would do is they'd make the training more specific towards the movements that you need as you're coming in towards your season and more general at the start. And that's why if, if people ever read any of the stuff I put out there, I talk about movement patterns. Yes. yes you yes. have a pushing movement pattern or a pulling movement pattern and knee dominant pattern, whatever, that is general and gets more specific to the sport you need. However, People take that to the extreme and make it too specific to their sport, which causes an overuse injury or maybe tendonitis, um, bursitis might flare up. Um, and this is where these things start to go wrong because they become too specific. They're not understanding that they're going to get enough volume from that specific movement. So like a boxer with a punch, they get enough of that from actually boxing. Would a 400 pound bench press help them knock someone out? Maybe if they can transfer that raw force into the punch, but adding more volume of pressing on top of punching is just going to end up with shoulder problems. Okay, if they do not then look at the postural muscles in the back, the stability through the lats and getting that even. So this is why sometimes in the off season, you will have more work if you work with me, focus towards building the base strength in the muscles you don't use at the start to really get that, the body tolerable. Yeah. Well, to it yeah because this is the thing with balance actually i've mentioned this when i've taught level two courses i'll often ask people does training need to be balanced and everyone will go oh yes yes it does no it doesn't humans are not balanced right as an example let's say with the sports you do right your quads might respond from lifting from squats and whatnot to say six thousand kilos of total volume per month which is very very low you're like okay but that you've got hyper responsive quads brilliant that's all we need to do. Whereas your hamstrings might need 20,000 kilos of volume. And that's what people miss. They'd go, well, no, I'll do 6,000 for quads, 6,000 for 
hamstrings and wonder where they get injured. And that's where volume tolerance comes in. And that was something spoken about by Dr. Fred Hatfield. Um, he's got his, his books are awesome. They essentially are, it's either power, bodybuilding, like powerlifting. And then the secondary part of all of those titles is a scientific approach. Yes, yeah, so Dr. Fred Hatfield and his books to really get into volume tolerances and those kind of things. It's well worth digging in just because the stuff that he wrote back in like the 60s and 70s is still super viable now. Okay, and that's what people tend to forget when it comes to their programming is they will make it almost sports specific. And that's the problem is what they're doing isn't necessarily incorrect. It's just they're not understanding what sports specific training is to get better at a sport. You do the sport to help you perform better in the sport. You must train everything else to allow you to perform. And then there's that point of diminishing returns. Right? If you look at Andy Murray, tennis player. You can do certain things to help him get better at his sport. Then if you spend too much time focusing on strengthening his posterior chain, as an example, when is there going to be the tipping point that will take away from his sports practice to put into his strengthened conditioning training? And then it's diminishing returns, which is another mistake that happens yes. is people put in too much effort to their S&C, neglecting their sport. Yeah. So it's, it's like a, it's, it's a pendulum effect, isn't it? They do, they go too far the other way, which is where it takes several years to, to understand where this needs to be. And this is where people talk about what's called concurrent training. Concurrent training meaning that you peak multiple things at the same time. Now, concurrent training is very, very good if you're already many, many years down the line and you've got a, a good work okay. capacity anyway somebody new not so much now this was what the um the russians discovered because they used to train people concurrently before like the well just before the fall of the soviet era how that sort of changed is they used concurrent training and then they started to go towards block periodization and um, that's where you find the book by vladimir Is ishirin is how you say his surname the book's just called periodization okay. um and obviously tudor bumper has a book of a similar title as well for sports and what they found was that concurrent training helped people when they were already elite. However, they got better results by doing block periodization because it allowed them to work on building a massive base of GPP to get more specific for the sport to peak at their sport. Mm -hmm. However, that's using Olympic athletes specifically, meaning they competed in usually one discipline. And this is again, something else that people perhaps don't consider is if you've only got one discipline to compete in, yeah, block periodization can be great. If you're a multi-sport athlete, again, if we take football, you need strength, endurance, power, speed, strength, strength, speed. You need the ability to laterally move very, very well. So you need lots of stability. You need recoverability if you fall over. You need good balance, good proprioception, as well as general skill with the ball. That's like nine things already, just straight out the bat. Concurrent training may be better for that type of person. And then somebody would try and apply block periodization in the wrong way. So again, that's where the, the person, as you said at the start, you have to ask and find out what the athlete's doing. And that's what even when working with a team, working with a team is even harder. Yeah, that's really interesting. I've also uh, listened to a Joe DeFranco podcast. Do you know him? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, he said something great. I mean, in my opinion, he said the biggest characteristic the test to have uh, uh, any athletes is not strength, explosivity or whatever, is availability. So being able to like perform every week. So especially for athletes, I guess the most important thing is yeah, um, became stronger, faster, more explosive, but also being able to like play week in and week out. And that's- Oh yeah, what, yeah 100%. Yeah, yeah 100%. Because- like um, Joe DeFranco, he also had links in, if memory serves, with Westside Barbell, didn't he? And again, Westside Barbell's method, like Louis Simmons, he uses the conjugate method, which is in a very advanced form of like complex training where they're constantly maxing out. Like I mentioned earlier on, that training on the nerve, that's what they're doing, but they're picking different movement patterns through the same, or different exercises of a movement pattern through the same pool so that they can still hit that high threshold of neurological demand without necessarily fatiguing the body in a in just doing the same movement all the time, okay. which is why the training for Westside Barbell is actually, it's very, very good to do, provided you adhere to the way 
it's supposed to be done. Because some people will start to do it and they go, oh, well, well, maybe I'll max out on two lifts. Or maybe I'll max out on three now and I'll do triple the volume. It's like, no, there's a reason it is written and prescribed in a specific way at the start. And then you get more nuanced as you get better. I, I found that even though people will say, oh, well, everyone's different. You need to find what works for you. Incorrect. You need to earn the right to find what works for you. Because at the start, everyone comes in at that base level. Yes, some are a bit higher than others because of their childhood. They were exposed to more sports. Uh, if I get somebody who's never lifted before, how on earth am I going to find exactly what they need to lift? I'm not. I'm going to start them off with what I know will work for millions of other people because it's been proven to work for millions of other people through research. We can see it's worked. That's where we start. And yeah, we have the nuance and the individual difference in there. If they're build, it, say they've got antiverted hips, for example, we might not use a specific style of squat, but yet we will still follow the same general periodization or waviness of load and pattern in terms of programming until they have built up a certain work capacity where, okay, now I can see that you don't need much volume on your quads. You need more intensity. The next person, okay. We found out through a year of trading, keeping it basic, that you need more volume on your quads. And that's how you start to find where that individual difference comes in. You can't know it from the start. And that's one thing I find that a lot of people will, they almost use it as an excuse because it's not wrong. Then people say, oh, well, it depends. Oh, that it annoys me. Because it is true. It depends. It's a perfectly viable answer. However, it's a lazy answer half the time. Because you can say it depends. However, why not turn around and someone they say, well, what am I supposed to do? Instead of it depends. Why are you looking to gain X, Y, Z result? Or how are you looking to perform specifically? What is the desired outcome you're looking for? Ask deeper probing questions to get a, because then you can say, right, based on the evidence, here is where you would roughly start rather than just saying, well, it depends. Okay. Ask questions to, to expand that. Because most people will start at a very basic level and it's usually pretty similar, to be fair. And then once they've trained for long enough, they've gained and earned that right to make it more specific. Uh, if you look at, um, you've got Andrei Milanachev as a powerlifter. I th from what I'd heard, all he does is like, he squats, he benches, he deadlifts, that's it. Like Ilya Illison, like right at the top of that pyramid, all he did was snatch and clean and jerk. They are very extreme examples that all they do is their sport lifts and some accessory work off season. They didn't start there. They started probably doing everything to find what they needed. And it took them years and years and years to refine it to that very fine point. Okay. Most people come in and say, well, no, you can't copy what they are doing because they're already 15 years ahead of where you are. Rather than looking at what your, your peers or your aspirations are doing currently, look at what they did. Look at what they found to work and what they didn't and why they found it not to work. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that you need to follow their exact path? Well, that's going to be a judgment call you're going to have to make. Okay. And that's where your, your own individuality does come into it. And the whole it depends thing and what is right for the person is viable. But to know that, you've got to pick a starting point and keep it as simple and as consistent as possible, at least in my experience. Got it. Oh, that's great. Even with sports, it can be related. Like if someone sees a workout of Tom Brady or Cristiano Ronaldo right now, yes. they might have like, like pliability with bands, stuff like that, just mm. to like preserve the body from injuries. Maybe if you see their workouts 20 years ago, they were doing like totally different stuff. And you as an athlete has to look at that training, not this one. If it exactly that, yeah. And even with that, I mean, that's where you will find out. This is where experience trumps almost everything because they'll be able to turn around and go i used to do all of this but never do that because it's terrible it doesn't work it just hurts you but it's like in business as well right you can speak to somebody about business in fitness especially you're like, okay here's how it works with say instagram here's how your grid needs to look here's what people are liking here's what this demographic that you are trying to appeal to wants to hear wants to know and then the person will go, oh, yeah, that's great, but I think I'll just do it my own way. Why not learn from someone's experience of, okay, they're saying to you, you can save five years of trial and error by listening. And people don't. They're like, 
oh, but I think I know better. I'm like, trust me, I was that person once. You don't know better. <laughs> I didn't know better. And yeah. I made many, many mistakes because of it. And that's why now sometimes you need to have that. You need to be objective with it and sometimes take a bit of a leap of faith and go, okay, well, they're telling me that this path definitely doesn't work. Now I can potentially walk it myself and then 10 years down the line go, they were right. Or now there's a presented opportunity. They're advising me to follow it this way based on their experience. Do I trust their experience that this would get me there maybe quicker or get me to a higher peak? And that's where it's the, that's where the element of trust comes into it. That's why coaches need to have coaches. That's why all professional high level athletes have their own coach is because they understand they need there to needs what? to be that yeah there needs to be that reliance on them that sort of bit of faith and you get others that go oh, i'm going to do it all on my own if you can more power to you brilliant mm -hmm. why though why take that risk of wasting years when there's a good chance this person already knows how to get you from a to b much quicker they might not be able to get you c d e onwards but they can get you from a to b missing all of these mistakes missing all of these potential injuries and all the rest of it and that's like one of the hard things uh, especially in sport which is where that visualization comes into it it's like well if you want to see yourself moving forwards what's going to be quicker doing it on your own or having people literally pointing you in the right direction from day one and that's a different mindset i mean the sports psychology side of things now is is absolutely enormous there is so much depth in there it's like recovery from injury, isn't it? They might be physically recovered within six months, but mentally that might take them six years. Yeah. Or maybe never to recover because they, they think the body can't handle it when it can. And then when they think they can't handle it, this is where you have that natural reciprocal inhibition. You, you will start to self-limit and, and almost create phantom pain sometimes to stop yourself being able to do it even if you can do it physically, you're, you're mentally stopping yourself because you've got that fear it's that's tough. holding you back. And I mean, God, the, that side of the industry is, that's where there's a lot of money to be made. Sports rehab is one thing, um, injury therapy, that stuff, but the sports psychology and rehabbing people forwards, the habit change and all that, oh, there's a lot of good information there. A lot of good an, English, information. an English example is Michael Owen. Before the injury, he was one of yeah. the best players in the world. After the injury, he, he said after his career that he didn't think like he could have run and changed direction as he used to do. So he decided mm. to play, play simple. Oh, that, he was one of those athletes. He was almost like too powerful for his own body. Yeah, he could generate yeah. that much torque and that much force. That was why he didn't want to, as you say, he didn't want to go all out because he could literally tear his own body apart. And yeah. that's what injuries do to you, though, unfortunately, which is always a massive shame. Yeah, about the injuries, many, many coaches say that the core is, more, is, is really important. Core and glutes, like the trunk of our body is important. While others say that if you do, for instance, squat, bench, bench press and deadlift, you're already eating the core. What's your thought about that? Because I've got my own opinion based on the science and my experience. I want to mm. listen to yours first. No, it's a very good point. Now, I can understand it from the perspective of like power lifters, where people say, oh, all you need is squat, bench and deadlift to get massively strong and build your core and all the rest of it. And all you have to do is look at like Kurt Kowalski. That man was like muscle on muscle and pretty much all he did was the powerlifting stuff. The same as Mark Chalet and those kind of people. You're like, okay, there's clearly something there. So it does hit your core. However, there is always going to be a need for some form of specific or potentially specific core work because of what the person is doing. Right, let's take a wrestler. Right, a wrestler needs to have a strong core, but they also need to be very dynamic wrestling bridges if they grab someone and suplex them they get them for a single leg and move in there's there's different angles that they might need right for that will squat bench and deadlift give them the core that they need to be an effective wrestler maybe for some people yes for the majority probably not because you need to have a certain level of stiffness and rigidity in your body for powerlifting to be completely braced and if that's what your body knows 
yeah, your core will be strong. However, it might not be strong in the right way for what you need it for in your sport. And that's where the specific breakdown of the sport will come into it. Yeah. Yes, it can, it can be, yeah, for lack of a better term, yeah, it can, it can be stiff. That will also then come down to um, a person's movement capability. Have you ever heard of Ido Portal? Yes, primal movement. I was going to yeah. ask you about, the, about him. Uh, yeah, you look at Ido's stuff and how he moves and all the rest of it. The way he's moving now, what people seem to forget, he, he was a high-level capoeira expert I'm pretty sure he was a high level gymnast at some point as well, he's mentioned. Right. That is a very strong core in lots of different ways. However, would, would the strength that his core have translate to powerlifting? Maybe, maybe not, certainly at the start, but then there'd be a certain level of, okay, you have to give up some of this to gain more of that. And that's where the question is gonna be, okay, well, what do we need it for? Will squat bench and deadlift help build your core? Well, yes, they will. Will they build your core in the right way to be a gymnast? No. For that, you're going to need to practice L-tucks you know, like and V-sits and all those kind of things specific to the, the sport that you need. Yes. So that's where the nuance comes into it. Is They're not wrong in saying that squat, bench and deadlift are basic, simple, minimalistic moves because I'm biased towards that sort of training. I really like that style of training because it supplements the sports and stuff that I do, which is like grappling, martial arts, that kind of stuff. Yet the core work that I get is then very specific to the, the sports that I'm doing. Okay. So that's where it comes from. Got so it. I can understand it from both sides of the coin. Yeah. My opinion is that core, especially for athletes, you have to work on anti, anti-flexion, anti-extension, rotation. So you can yeah. be minimalistic for the core and the lower body, I would say. While mm. uh, talking about minimalistic training, uh, have you heard of Alpha Destiny? Uh, out yes. alpha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I love this style of training, and so basically for the upper body, I now do only pull ups and dips because it's so easy yeah. to plan and is do like hundreds of hundreds of push ups, dips, like simple movements a lot. Mm. You probably like the work. You'd like the um the older writings of Pavel Satsulin talking about like minimalistic training. There's a book by Pavel called Beyond Bodybuilding. Easy in here, Pavel. Brilliant book. Yeah, Pavel's really, yeah. and again, the minimalistic stuff is good because those sorts of things, they were designed to be used for either like tactical sort of like military forces or athletes so that they could get a nice base of strength while still doing their sport. And this is where if you look at kettlebells, I love me some kettlebell training. Right, the Turkish get up, that's working your entire body through a lot of different ang joint angles and ranges of motion as you're moving, you've got to be strong and stable to do that. And yet you also have to be able to move while maintaining that stability. And that, those are the sorts of exercises that give you quite a lot. Like you were saying about the um, anti-flexion, anti-rotation, those things. I actually teach that in some of the courses that I run for the places I teach. And in the way I write it is that the first one, you've got pattern, right? So top corner, I write pattern on the board. And in those three elements of pattern, We've got the range of movement, okay. the structure of the person, and their stability. So what I have to look at is, okay, do they have anything that will impair range of movement? Yes or no? Okay, brilliant. Now let's have a look at, is, is it a structural thing? Do they have one leg shorter than the other from birth? Is there an accident? Do they have kyphosis, lordosis, those things? And then stability, okay, can they stand on one leg for 20 seconds? Can they balance on one arm for 20 seconds? So they go through those three things first with the pattern. So the, if the pattern's a squat, that's where the stand on one leg will come from. And then they move into loading. So I'll write loading on the board. Above loading, I would write range of motion first. Because some people are kind of okay in the first blocks, the pattern box. And then you simply need to increase their depth, build their confidence. So before we're gonna look at adding actual load, we're just gonna get you having a full range of motion from a health standpoint. So people say, do I need a full range of movement squat? For health, I believe you do. You need to be able to get hamstrings and calves touching so that you could essentially go to the toilet. What some people call the third world squat. That's what I'd like to see from everyone and be able to stand up from a health standpoint. From a performance standpoint, it's different. Once they can do that, then it will be adding sets and reps. That's the second element of loading build up the volume first. And then it's, I put percentage, just the percentage symbol. Yeah. 
then you can start adding load. If it's a squat, that might be a band, then a goblet squat, then a front squat, barbell, back squat, low bar squat. So it progresses as they need. From there, a line comes down and I write asymmetrical, which is what you're talking about. So the first one of asymmetrical is anti-rotation, right? So that will simply be unilateral work. Yes. Can they do a lunge or lunge variations? Then there's also anti-rotational work with loading. So can they do a lunge with a bilateral load? Then can they do a lunge with a unilateral load? Once they can do all of those and they're perfectly stable, loaded, unloaded on single arms, single legs, whatever, then we add in rotation. Can they lunge and twist? Can they lunge and throw? Can they lunge and pull across them? So then you start combining movements. So you've got pattern, load, asymmetry with all those extra bits in it. And then that shoots across to power. So yeah, before they can do power yeah. stuff, I'm like, right, can you lower yourself eccentrically? I'm not talking about, you can use negatives. So say like 110% or 120% for like slow negatives. I just mean, can they lower for 10 seconds, pause at the bottom for like three to four and stand back up. Then I might look at using heavier eccentrics or negatives on like the chins and those things. There's, there's extra nuance that goes into that, but it's like, can they control the eccentric? Because before you can produce force, you must be able to stabilize it. So can you, uh, hence, are they stable first? Can they absorb it, the eccentric? Okay, now we can produce it. If they can't do any of either of the first two without compromise, I'm like, right, we need to take a few steps back and find out where the missing link is or what's not quite working. Once they can do that, we move to ballistic training. Now, ballistic training has got quite a wide umbrella for it. The way I look at ballistic training is concentric only. So think battle rope slams, medicine ball throws, um, a box jump, something that doesn't have you landing and then requiring that aromatization phase to then rebound off immediately again. That's a plyometric movement. And plyometrics is last. Okay. Yeah, so once they've, again, they've gotten the eccentrics, the ballistics, then we can move on to plyometric work because the plyometric work requires a certain element of strength. Like, did you know it was in the um, science and practice of strength training um, by, is it uh, Zatsyorsky or Verkoshansky? I think the second one. I can't remember which one. The second I think it's one, Edmont, yeah. yeah. Test with plyometric counter movement, jumps and stuff like that. Yeah, that, uh, that might be where I got it from then. But it says that you need a double body weight squat. What is that? To, yeah, for like those, for those plyometric movements. And that's because it helps you with your ligaments, your tendons and all of those things being strong enough and stable enough to actually deal with those forces and absorb them properly. And this is what some people miss out on. So when you'll see people that are doing even ballistic work or, ply or plyometric work as they call it, and let's say they're overweight, I'm looking at it, I'm like, that's your PT or your class instructor has programmed that. And it's okay, it's fun, I get it, but that's gonna cause you problems because yeah. your body's not ready for it. I mean, the injury might not happen now, it, it, there's gonna be something that falls off. And that's why when I teach that little four sort of stage thing, it doesn't mean everyone goes through it that way. Some people go pattern and they're ready for the explosive stuff straight away because they're experienced. It just gives people things to pick and choose from. And then they can feel, see how many different options they've got. And that's from a sporting perspective as well. If I'm working with someone, I'll go, okay, so what patterns do you have that you're really good at? Awesome, okay, what patterns do you have that you are not good at? Okay, let's maybe deal with these first from a prehab standpoint to help you minimize the risk of injury. So it's just like one of those ways to sort of get things around going on to your point, as you said, quite rightly about the, the anti-flexion, anti-rotation, all those kind of things, because they are incredibly crucial <laughs> depending on the sport you're going to do. So you're quite right in what you're saying. Yeah. And I was thinking about two topics related to your argument: the plyometric training, like in sports and uh, like soccer or even athletics, the one that are, I don't know, free, thousand meters and stuff like that they do a uh, plyometric even with like 10 12 year old uh, children but they don't have the strength so what's your thought should you do plyometric only when you reach uh, like a good amount of strength in your body or you can do that at the, even before if your sports require plyometric like in football and running 
that's a great question i've that's a conversation i've had several times before now this is where you have to look at um is that seriously like when they're talking when he was talking about plyometrics in terms of depth jumps the landing the um, the absorption and the immediate redispersion of that force immediately a plyometric by definition is a maximal effort when you're looking at sports running jumping and what kids do they're not putting in maximal effort yet because their bodies can't produce that much force. So I would say that what most children do is, is closer to ballistics because of their current levels of strength, right? And that's the thing is they'll get people doing the drills, like a high knee drill. They'll get them doing all of that before they necessarily go towards repeated bound jumping for like maximal efforts. And that's more of a skill that's a movement efficacy. That's teaching people how to move correctly. So when it comes to kids, that's where it's a bit different because they're being taught, hopefully, from day one, good, correct form. Now, if you've got good, correct form, that's where you can kind of break the rules a bit because you've already, you've got good form. Your body is learning how to move correctly. Right? You could look at anybody out running now, right? And you can look and go, okay, you are going to end up with an injury because your your running strike, your striding pattern is not right. Mm. And this is the sort of person that would then potentially need to look at what I'd said a minute ago and go, okay, where do we need to start you? But somebody like a child or a teenager that has no problems, you're like, okay, let's see what we can do here. This is a little bit different because they've got no pre-existing injuries or overly large imbalances in their posture or whatever, just as an example. That's where that comes into it. And this is like when people will say, oh, I know, don't have kids lifting weights, but they'll have kids doing sports, which goes to what you were saying. A lot of sports are highly ballistic and impactful in their nature. Like, lifting weights is not as dangerous as playing football, rugby, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yet, this is where when you look at gymnasts, young gymnasts especially, they do a lot of plyometric, you could say, and high impact stuff. And what happens when it's not, when their body's underprepared for it? they get injured, they burn out, and they stop training by the time they're 15, 16, 17, 18, and then have long-term injuries because their body wasn't ready for it, which then goes to the point of, okay, if you need this for your sport, we also need to get you lifting weights, which is where I'm sure it's an American study. They've been recent, oh, I'm gonna have to, I'll have to look it up because I cannot remember. They were looking at early sports specialization versus people that came a little bit later yeah and that's what you found if you have early sports specialization there'll be young junior champions that they will break potentially unless you get a genetic anomaly which is what they find like you look at china with weightlifting they will look for people they will look for the kids that are the right height the right build and everything and they will also get them doing gymnastics and a few other things to build them into weightlifting so they can be the best weightlifters uh, but I th I'm sure it's an American study that's been looking at the, okay, if we take purely sports specific, you're only doing this one sport, early specialization, versus somebody who starts that same sport later, who gets higher? And it's the people that started later because they've gotten stronger, their body's more robust, their hormones have kicked in, they've got more muscle, more stability. They have more movement efficacy from doing lots of different sports rather than this very narrow field of sports, which has now led to overuse injuries, repetitive strain and stuff like that. So where this person's burnt out at maybe 16 or 18 and won several junior championships, this person that started at 14 or 15, maybe a bit later, gets into their 20s and 30s and they can still keep going. Now, that's not to say that you won't get the early sports specialization people. There was a Russian gymnast who was, I think he was still in the Olympics and he was like 48 or something silly. He was, like, it was a very old gymnast. That's the exception. That's not the rule. That's like a very, that's unique, which is why we know about them because they are unique. And I think that's what people forget. They look at all of these athletes and go, oh, but there's so many of them. Yes, they are all exceptions. That's why we know of them because they are exceptional. They're not the average person. Yeah. And that's where I find that comes into it is like from a, from a kid's standpoint to go back to your question, it's not wrong to have them doing their sport, however, to have them specializing or competing at a high level. I'd say people are better off waiting for a while to allow the child to mature, to get stronger, to get more robust and injury proof before they hyper specialize, just so that again, mentally, they don't suffer the same level of fatigue and they actually learn to enjoy the sport they're doing for a longer period of time, as opposed to feeling they've been forced into it and it's a kind of indenturement 
if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. And what's your thought about jumping rope? Because in my experience, I found it um, really good. I know that it's not like plyometric, but when I do, especially single leg jump rope, then in the game, I feel much, much better. But I don't know if I can classify this as a conditioning exercise or plyometric. What's your thought? <laughs> That's a great question. There's a, there's a chap I know, actually, his name is Chris Walker, and I'm pretty sure his Instagram handle is Jump Rope Coach. But if you type in Chris Walker, Jump Rope, like Chris is fantastic with the rope. He, some of the tricks and stuff he does, he's awesome. Um, the jump rope itself is sort of like a low level, it's low level bounding. It's like almost a little bit below plyometrics. Coming from a boxing background, skipping was a nightmare i used to hate skipping because i couldn't do it mm -hmm. however it helped me strengthen my achilles tendons because i used to skip barefoot as well so it made me more sensitive more tactile on the floor so i could feel what was going on a bit more it helped with posture with breathing with pace i'm actually a massive fan of skipping from from a conditioning standpoint um, i'm not sure where i read this but i think skipping for an hour is supposed to burn if you skip at a decent pace around about 700 calories or slightly more which is the same as running with less impact in like a traumatic sense. Because when people run, they, if they land with a heel strike, you're essentially putting on the brakes when you run with a heel strike. You're sort of jamming yourself into the floor and that's why people start to get problems. But jump rope, you land ball flat. That's how you're supposed to land from a jump or a plyometric movement or something explosive is ball flat to absorb the forces. That's why our bodies work that way. If you step off of something, you don't land on your heel, do you? That's just going to hurt. That's going to jar you, hurt your knee, jar your hip, damage your cubis bone. You land on the balls of your feet to absorb. And then you have that slight bend in your knees as you catch it and that bend in your hips. And that's what skipping actually allows you to do. It starts to teach you how to land correctly and sustain repeated, repeated jumps, for lack of a better term. So skipping for like footballers and general athletes that need to be able to constantly move is very, very useful. It's very, very useful because it's breathing related as well. If you read any of the book, there's, um, there's a book called Breath. That's very, very good. And there's another one called The Oxygen Advantage. I cannot remember the authors of those two books. They're on my, um, on, on my Audible list that I've listened to recently. But one's called Breath. One's called The Oxygen Advantage. And if you're running, sometimes people, they don't think about their breathing because they're trying to not fall over and trip over stuff. But skipping, all you've got to do is just skip. And then you think about just breathing in through your nose and out through your nose. And that then starts to trigger the vagus nerve and really starts to help improve people, people's sort of like respiratory fitness and control of arousal, which is very useful for sport. Because yes. if you can, again, I'm sure you see it in football, if you can, like, you know, haze someone or rile them up, it throws off their pacing, which means they might fumble a pass or they might not get to a pass quick enough or get there too quick and it me me messes up the timing of that team because you've gotten them out of the mental zone they're in yes. so if you can learn again through breathing and that kind of stuff through the skipping how to regulate your arousal levels again that can also benefit your sport because that's another element of sport that most people on the psychology side they don't think about that's why you have like, as they call it you know you, you sort of talking people down and you see like boxing conor mcgregor was a great one for it he would sort of try and put people on and like make them angry or annoyed. So when they got into the cage, they wouldn't be on their normal game. They'd be in a slightly different mindset. Muhammad Ali was very good at it as well. He's very good at that psychological side of things. Arnold Schwarzenegger as a bodybuilder was a great one. Uh, there's stories in like his autobiography. And I think he was saying to Tim, uh, Tim Ferriss, author of The Tour of Titans, about it is he would say to people oh, have, have you had a knee injury lately because your legs are looking a bit small knowing full well they hadn't but he just mentioned it so it started to put them off and then when they started to train they would overdo their legs so their physique would be unbalanced so that's where, again where understanding mentality is absolutely massive for sport and the skipping can help you get into that rhythm of understanding how your body works how to breathe and how to stay calm uh, that's a great tip because uh, I've read a study a few years ago that many footballers have got a great cardiovascular system, but the respiratory oh, system God, yeah. is not great. It, I mean, it's mm -hmm. not at the level that of the cardiovascular system. And I was thinking, 
how is that possible? I mean, if I run, jump, and stuff like that, I should improve both of them. Instead, there are maybe some exercises that are more related to the breathing. Yeah, and uh, breathing is massive. Breathing is massive. That's like from a boxing standpoint. You can be throwing shots, and you might have a struggle with someone. You catch them in the ribs, or they can't breathe. You make their diaphragm spasm, and all of a sudden, they're going to burn out much quicker because they end up in that anaerobic sort of dominance so they start to they start to use up too much energy too quickly yes. so again it's those kind of things you have to be very aware of if you can control your breathing and your pacing triathletes are very very good for this because they know how to stay in that zone as it were you get out of that zone and you lose that regulation mm -hmm. it's going to cost you and regardless of how high your vo2 max is and that then links back to strength because people don't have enough strength, they can't get faster because they constantly think, well, I need more cardio. Well, no, you need to use your cardio better, which means your VO2 max might not need to be as high and you need more strength. If you can use more strength at a higher level repeatedly without getting fatigued or tired with a lower VO2 max, you will be faster. Proof of that, Paula Radcliffe. That's exactly what she did. Her VO2 max came down, but her strength levels went up and she started winning things. Yeah, so that's when it comes to the that's what efficiency is. Now, this goes back to what you were saying earlier on about sports and training. Right. I'll say to people, if you want to get good at your sport, you need to be efficient. Yeah, if we were training together, I'd want you to be as efficient at your sport as possible, which is why I'd be like, OK, who's your soccer coach? Work with them in exactly what you need. For me, I need to make you inefficient in your training so that you become better. Sports is about efficiency. Building a base of fitness and strength is about inefficiency. That doesn't mean unsafe. It just means I need to get you doing things where at the end of it, you're like, oh, I, I can feel that. That was a good stimulus. And it makes your body go through that stimulus recovery adaptation phase, you know, super compensation and stuff like that. Training needs to be inefficient to build movement efficacy so that then you can, or efficacy in general, so then you can transfer that to efficiency for your sport. Um, I believe it was An Antonio Bondarchuk in the transfer of training in sport. I'm pretty sure that was the title of the book, The Transfer of Training in Sport, where he discusses all this. He was a hammer thrower, if memory serves, about you need to get your training to a certain place in efficiency and then have that transfer to the sport that you're doing. And that's where, again, it's a deeper style of periodization and how it all links in and together. And there's certain links that people miss. Some do it naturally. And that's where sometimes the best athlete does make the best teacher because they just happen to just do it. Whereas a good teacher or a good coach will be like, why did that happen? It's, <laughs> it's, a, Russian, it's a Russian joke, actually. I heard this from Pavel Satsul and it was, um, I can see that works excellent in practice, but how does it work in theory? Just made me laugh. Yeah, that's good. Yeah that's sort of how they sort of like they reverse engineer things from like his Russian anecdotes and stuff is they knew that things worked, but they wanted to know why it worked. And in terms of periodization like, and that sort of training methodology from them, the biggest three things, if memory serves, was waviness of load, meaning that you don't just have a standard linear progression. You have, for lack of a better term, random. It's completely random. So if we were doing five by five, right, in a session, you might, instead of doing five by five at 220 pounds, or 225 you'd have a set of five at 220 then a set of five at 300 then a set of five at 180 and then a set of five at 270 and then a set of five at 290 so it'd be completely random and dynamic and that yields better results even in a long-term programming sense than constantly going up because you're getting the loading and unloading of the body and the nervous system so it's more adaptive regulation the second thing that they use is what's known as specialized variety um, and that is what we discussed earlier on. You might have front squats one week, back squats the next week. So think Louis Simmons, West Side Barbell for those sorts of things. And what was the third element of it? So you had waviness of load, specialized variety, and what was the third one? It will come to me in a second. I'm sure it will float yeah. into the head. There's an article on it on that's been written up by in breaking muscle yes and i think it was craig maker or craig marker who's written that article and he writes about that in there and i know pavel's got a couple of articles on there as well 
um, as he has on the Strong First website. And there is one more element. It's just my brain is gone. And I just can't quite remember what it is. Specialized variety, waviness of load. No, the third one's gone. It's gone. I've, I've got it on my notes somewhere. I'm sure I could find it. But it's oh. gone for the second. We'll come back to it. We'll come back to it. And uh, about strip and conditioning, yeah. Do you think that as an athlete should train, should train, should focalize on conditioning other than the training with the team? Like I'll do my, I'll may, I'll explain my example. Like if I train with the team twice, three times per week, should I then maybe go for a jog or for a heat like intensity interval training, or it makes more sense to strength con strength uh, sessions? Because now with the knowledge that I know, like. I can say that maybe it's more beneficial than strength because like it's the weakest link of my performance. But back when I was young, maybe when I was 15 or 16, the idea in my environment was extra training is go for a jog, go for a run. Like what's your thought yeah. about? Yeah, that's a, yeah. No, that, that is a, that's an excellent question. And this is when it comes to the difference of you've got, there's strength and conditioning, which people confuse with conditioning and more conditioning. Exactly, exactly. Right. Exactly. Now, this goes back to what we said earlier on about the, say, six months off season, six months in season, whatever it is. In the off season, it's like, okay, what can we work that you need the most of? To me, that's always going to be strength because strength, lean muscle mass muscle, and that sort of stuff is very hard to build. Cardio, you can peak your cardio in about six weeks maybe 10 it doesn't take long to get your cardio up to a good level but it takes a lot longer for strength to happen so again i'm biased i'm not gonna lie i'm biased towards strength the higher you can make your absolute strength and then see where your relative strength needs to be so for, as for football for argument's sake that might be you need a a double body weight deadlift um a body weight overhead press and 15 strict pull-ups as arbitrary examples right if you can do those i'm like great we can sustain that that's great we're going to keep that there and we're going to focus more on your sports skill if you can't do those i'm like right we need a bit more time in the weight room so let's bring down the, the cardio the conditioning to build up the strength once that's there okay let's bring the conditioning back in what level do we need your conditioning that it's getting where it needs to be where we can also have the minimal amount of strength that you need with minimal sessions so you might only need two strength sessions a week to sustain those arbitrary numbers we've just given, one conditioning session a week to, to keep your sort of, your extra CV that you need, because you've then got say six training sessions a week, which might be three days worth of training, but double two a day training sessions. Those are also gonna give you a cardio and people forget that. Yeah. When you are training, like especially in football, the, the kids that I've known and people that I've known to play football, I mean, their practice sessions are what, two hours long, and then they'll go and play a game. And this is something I've always personally I've disagreed with because what they will do is they will make their players tired, fatigued, so their performance is on the decline, and then they will try and teach them highly complex skills. That is not sensible because you will then start to learn that skill from the most efficient way possible, meaning your body will be changing its alignment to use less energy to allow you to perform it, which doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be the best way to perform it, from a longevity standpoint. So if you're going to learn a new skill and you've got, and it, it's not grooved into your body in that like neurological sense, learn it first, get it in your body, get that muscle memory in that inter and intramuscular coordination, get it all locked in so that you have good form. Then you can build conditioning on top of that specifically, but don't try and learn something new tired. And that's what I find a lot of sports places will do, which goes back to what you were rightly saying of, Oh, it's, the answer is always more cardio. Well, no, it's not. The answer is you need to learn skills first, then do strength work and then conditioning work. So if you're training three times a day, you'd have skill in the morning, strength in the afternoon, and then conditioning in the evening. You wouldn't have conditioning first because you could have conditioning and conditioning. Great. Conditioning, then strength. You're There's not... arguments for it. It's just not wise. You're not maximizing the strength performance if you do if you run first. Mm. Uh, you should yeah, know not. my coaches when I was from 11 to 16, 17, because the first, especially the first training of the week, we used to do aerobic training 
out of three trainings. Mm -hmm. Like one was aerobic training, the I mean the beginning of the session, then uh, like velocity, yeah. speed, and then rapidity. But especially the first one in like two hours of training. The first for the first forty minutes were about running, uh, eat stuff like that, and then we were about doing technique and skill works. So it yeah. should have been the opposite, right? That would have been potentially more ideal, yes. Because yeah. people will get a level of conditioning from doing skill stuff anyway. That's the thing with skill is you want to get it to the point of you don't slow down or you don't see things start to go wrong. If I relate this to strength conditioning speed, right? If somebody's doing sprints or, some, or a weightlifting movement, a snatch or a clean and jerk, Right. If you've got a Tendo unit, great. You can actually track the speed of the bar and all the rest of it. Or if you've got the right camera equipment, you can see when they're slowing down. Otherwise, you have to go by eyeballing it or like a stopwatch. The second they start to lose performance, they're done. But what that does, though, is that might only be two or three sprints. OK, well, if you want more sprints from this person, you're going to need longer rest, which is why some high level sort of professionals will have training sessions of like four hours because they're having so much rest in it. Now there was a sprinter, it was Barry Ross. He was a sprint coach and it's really, they mention it in easy strength. And I think he'd have people do like five sets of two on deadlift with like five to 10 minutes rest in between each because he wanted them to be like as fresh as possible, right? Yeah. I might be getting that confused with an MMA fighters routine, but that's the sort of general idea of it is they wanted each set to be completely high level and that was also the same in the sprinting as well meaning that they would do a 100 meter sprint or 200 meter sprint and then they would rest six seven eight nine ten minutes now you say that to some people and they're like that's sacrilege uh, having that much rest so well no because having that much rest will then allow them to perform at a high level which is high intensity interval training not what people think high intensity interval training is which is more just a case of at best sort of anaerobic training where they're just constantly going and yeah. that's where it comes into performance and those things i mean were your coaches wrong to do what they did no not necessarily they just might be might have been a bit behind the times because obviously we've evolved now haven't we and this goes back to what we said right at the start of the conversation with do you go and find it your own way which people will do that they'll follow all their own They'll just do more conditioning, more conditioning, more conditioning. Or do you listen to people that have already done that, like us, and gone, actually, that wasn't the best way to do it? Do they then listen to a professional and potentially get better results? Yes. And then that it comes full circle to, okay, are you going to have that trust in your coach? And that's where a lot of people, they just struggle to let go of that control sometimes. Yeah. You were talking before about bias, that you have some bias in training, and I have one like a big one. Uh, I do squats, of course, and uh, I'm obsessed with not getting injuries uh, because I've heard a few players, uh, a lot of players, tear their ICL and they are out for like a an year and so it's... And when I do squats, I focus a lot on the eccentric part and yeah. I always, even in season, do full squats because in my mind, if I do full squats with an eccentric, uh, like, focusing on the eccentric all the time, I feel like stronger. Is that a bias based on your uh, knowledge and experience? Or is that kind of true that if you do full squat, maybe you are less prone to injury than doing a quarter squat because you do like the eccentric part for a more range of motion, if it makes now, sense. I would, I'd say it is a combination of the two. However, it's a, it's a, it's a correct bias because, like we said earlier on, if you wanted to improve certain amounts of torque or force output from a quarter squat, which was needed for sprinting, you would do those. However, to do only those at the exclusion of other things will get you injured. So you might do um, five sets of one on the quarter squat, real heavy overload for it. And then you might do five sets of three to five on a full range of motion squat with a lighter load, focusing on the eccentric. So, so you're not wrong in what you're saying. It's a good bias to have, and it's not a bias that isn't based in, in logical science. And again, some people will agree with it. Some people won't. Charles Poliquin was more of the stage of, okay, well, let's get you strong in these bits you need and then make sure everything else stays 
where it needs to be by doing back off work, or what he would call functional hypertrophy. Um, I believe he speaks about that in the Poliquin Principles. Great book to read if, if people haven't read it, real good book. The newest revision also talks about the, uh, the splits of training volume. So having like 38% of volume in week one and then 15% in week two, up to 25% in week three and how it, all the volume changes, which is like really, really useful okay. to look at. Um, yeah, I wouldn't say you're wrong in saying that from an injury standpoint. Um, in regards to the full range of motion squat, the only consideration for that for an individual will be the length of their femurs and the length of their torso and their overall build. Because people that like me, I've got long femurs in relation to my torso. I've got quite a short body in relation to my legs. Okay. Um, squats to me don't do much for my quads. It's all hamstrings and glutes when I squat. Right? So for me, doing more full range of motion squats, it just gets more glutes and hamstrings. If I do more partial range of motion squats or like powerlifting style to just on the parallel or more lunges, a partial range of movement again, or a limited range of movement, split squats, whatever, I get more benefit from the quad. But that is then an individual difference that some people aren't aware of. So that's where, as I said, the bias, your bias is a good one. It's not incorrect. And that's then when you go, okay, this is my bias. This is how I feel. Let's look at the person I'm working with. Is this also correct for them? And again, most footballers tend to have a very similar build. You gravitate what, towards what you are built to do. Most good swimmers all look the same. Most good powerlifters all look the same. They all have a very similar stature. That's a very common thing. Right? All good deadlifters have short, well, most good deadlifters have short bodies and long legs. Most good bench pressers have really wide chests and little short, maybe T-Rex arms. So we again have to have those considerations in there as well. But what you're saying about training your overload parts and then your full range of motion stuff, no, I'd, I'd agree with that. I'd say it's pretty sensible to be fair. And something that most people in my experience won't do. They're all about the intensity, which is okay until you get injured. Yeah, even because, especially for an athlete, but not only for an athlete, for everyone, I want to still lift weight when I will be 50, 60, 70. So if I maybe maximize and try to perform for the next week, for the next month, and do maybe too much or doing incorrectly, it's not going to be beneficial over long term. That's yeah, no, 100%. I agree with that. Yeah, and um, when I texted you on Instagram, you were telling me that you have a tendonitis on the left leg. It's on my right leg. Right, no. le right leg, sorry. And so you're not able to do multidirectional training and uh, um, lateral force, force absorption, right? Yeah. So I was thinking uh, in positions such as goalkeepers in which they have to basically move Laterally, there is any, well, not only for goalkeepers, for everyone, uh, there, is, there are uh, maybe exercises that you, that you would recommend for lateral uh, strength, absorption and production, both in strength and plyometric, because the only exercise mm. that I can think of is lateral lunge or Cossack squat. The, Cossack squat's a good move. It's a very good move. Um, one thing I would look at, because it's something, the tendonitis that I've got in the back of my Achilles is, it's because of a knee injury. So I've been walking funny. Okay. And that's the result of something else that, as you're saying, people will get it because they don't have enough. Well, they don't have enough. So they don't have enough strength in their foot, which means they have a stiff ankle. That then leads to excessive movement in their knee and then a stiffening in their hips where their hip flexor overtakes. And then they start to get lower back problems like potentially so one thing i would do first of all is i'd have people barefoot doing things like a single leg deadlift right okay. suitcase deadlift those anything that is like we were discussing earlier on that's anti-rotation so loading one side of the body and using one leg to force them to stabilize first because then they have to have, be stable and have a good structure once we've done that okay now we can look at using maybe a stability disc to do a similar movement to do maybe a pistol squat or a shrimp squat a shrimp squat is similar to a pistol, but you'd be holding your foot in your hand behind you. So pulling your foot to your bum. Uh, Max Shank has a book called Ultimate Athleticism. You'll find shrimp squats in there if you're not sure of what they are. So you can get them doing those. Then after that, you start to look at, okay, now we can start doing hurdle stepping, just stepping over the hurdles to get used to it. Then you can start doing like hopping over the hurdles, jumping over the hurdles. You've also got the option of standing on one leg 
jumping and landing on two so that you're still landing more bias on one side, but you're supporting it. Then you step back and repeat. Then you can start to do your lateral movement jumps, like your skater jumps and all those kind of things, okay. landing in slightly different angles. And then it would be a case of, okay, are there any running drills you can do? So right, there's setups and cones where you'll sprint to the left and then cut to the right or sprint to the right and then fade away to the left. You, so you start to look at, I would say um, NFL, like National Football Sort of League, look at their kind of drills with agility ladders and those things. Oh, yeah. like where five, you can five, start to five, work five, on... The 5 yes. side, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. The T drills. So you can start to use that, the agility ladders and all that kind of stuff to just build into it. Because you are quite right. In terms of movements with like a barbell, there's not much you can do. Yeah, this is where you need to have that dynamic bit. And then that goes back to what you said about skipping. You can start to skip hopping side to side, skip on the one leg. You can start to skip forwards, backwards, left, right, forwards, backwards, left, right. So you're then building in all of that extra stability that you, stability in your foot, mobility in your ankle that you need with stability in your knee and then the mobility and stuff throughout the hip and how it works. That starts to give you ideas of how you can move. And this is where Ido Portal has got some good stuff. He will actually have people walking like on the side of their foot. So, you know, when you roll your ankle, you're like, oh, yes, that hurt. He'll have people walking like that. You'll need to research into why he has that people doing it. It's not the sort of thing that I may necessarily recommend. Yeah, in regards to a movement sense, that's what some people do. That then makes you think, could you use crawling drills to reduce the overall load? with having your feet or your ankles in certain positions to again, strengthen them in a good way. So you're not putting too much overload, you know, in one go. So that's how it starts to get you in there. You've also got like sliders. Uh, if you've got uh, like a laminate floor and you're stood on uh, like a piece of cloth, can you slide your foot out and drag it back in? Oh yeah, yeah. Can you reverse lunge back, keeping weight on the back foot, but on the instep of the foot rather than the ball? Are there ways you can load those? You can also do training for your tibialis anterior, like the muscle in the front of the shin. Hook your foot into a kettlebell and flex your toes. You can also do deadlifts with your feet, your toes raised to get a deeper stretch in the gastro, the hamstrings, and again, force your feet to work a bit more. Mm -hmm. So those are the sorts of drills you can do. And one of the easiest ones, if I'm honest, would just be getting outside on good surfaces, but unstable ones and just getting people walking on unstable surfaces starting off on grass and then stepping onto like smoother stones and those things because that will all start to get your foot working as a unit yeah because unfortunately where people wear modern shoes this is where the whole um, natural running movement came into it, like born to run um i cannot remember who wrote that book they were talking about the barefoot running and people did too much of it flip-flops barefoot walking stuff like that is very good you just need to build up to it over time because that makes your foot stable is by walking on unstable surfaces because it improves your proprioception yes. and all the muscles in your foot. Because you think you've got what, 26 bones in the human foot, I believe it is, isn't it? That's yeah. a quarter of the bones in total, like both feet, that's a quarter of the bones in your entire body in your feet. Your feet are meant to spread on the floor and people will not think about that. Even doing toe drills and thinking about training your foot, loosening up the fascia in your foot, stuff like that, can potentially help with lateral movements. So then it's a case of, okay, we looked at the drills, but what actually allows us to be able to perform those drills? Okay, it's the foot itself. Or do we know the anatomy of the foot? Do we know how the foot needs to work? Can we move all of our toes independently? Most can't. You tell somebody, okay, lift your little toe and it's just a piece of dead flesh that's there. They can't do yes, anything. I try, I try on myself. It's difficult. It's and again, if you start to work on all of those things, that can help. That can help with all the lateral drills and all the rest of it. Obviously, people would get a bit bored if you just told them to do specific foot drills. So you give them a little bit of what they want because it keeps them motivated mentally. They get the reward from it and it helps them. And yet, as a coach, that's where you need to, again, look at that. OK, what's the thing that really needs the work and how can I then program that in? to help the performance reduce the injury or do whatever it is that's needed. Can I do it in the gym? Can I do it on a field? Can I do it skipping? Can I do it in a bedroom? Obviously, if people are in lockdown currently, can I do it indoors? Yeah. Can I do it on a Swiss ball, a, a plate? Do I, have, do I have a BOSU ball? What have they got access to? And yeah. then you can sort of reverse engineer it from there, if that makes sense.
Yeah, about human performance, proprioception, and barefoot running, there is a great YouTube channel called The Bioneer. Maybe you've heard of it? Yeah, he's, in, he's down in Bournemouth, apparently. It's not too far away from um, where I am, I like, which is quite cool. <laughs> uh, where are you, by the way? Uh, I'm down towards uh, Southampton. Ah, okay, okay, okay. I'm in London, South London. Ah, nice, nice. Let's go uh, up there. I've... The last question I would say, uh, what's your favorite, uh, the, your top three podcast and top three like strength and conditioning coach? Like when you think about training, what's the top three person that comes on top of your mind? Okay, so top three podcasts, right, and, and things that I listen to. One of the first ones would have to be <laughs> Juggernaut Training Systems. Okay. So that's Chad Wesley Smith, Max Atia, those sorts of people. And I also found Dr. Mike Isratel and listened to a lot of his stuff through yeah. Juggernaut Training Systems. Um, so he's one of, he would probably be like the first um, coach that I would say people to go and look at because Dr. Mike is just, it's, it's no BS. It's very down the line. So he, watch his stuff on YouTube. And as for like podcasts and stuff, um, JTS, Juggernaut Training Systems, they've got a good one. Mm -hmm. uh, second podcast when it was still going was called Table Talk. And that was by Dave Tate that was a very very good podcast to listen to again it was it had a lot of experience in it and they were just talking about the methods what they've learned how it all works together jim wendler was off and on it and it was a very very good one to listen to um that takes me to the second sort of strength coach or i would say people need to look up even though like unfortunately the rest is still now he's passed away i'd say it's charles poliquin okay because of man was very intelligent very intelligent another one to look at again who's sadly passed away is dr fred hatfield so it's kind of like two for one there definitely look at those two people okay. um then the last podcast that i would suggest everyone listens to right from day one going to the archives is the strength coach podcast and that's mike boyle strength coach podcast and it's run by anthony renner uh, the information on there is just golden it's I've listened from day one, great podcast to listen to. They cover sports, business, all this. That's where I hear a lot of the studies from. So I get a lot of them off of there. I'm like, that's an interesting study. I'll go and look at that. They're real good for that. And then the last SNC coach, I suggest people go and have a look at. Of, oh, again, there's two. I'm a bit, but I like them both. So you got Pavel Satsulin. Okay. I found a lot of his older books when I, like years and years ago. And it, what he said just made a lot of sense. Very, very good to listen to. And obviously Christian Thibodeau as well. Christian Thibodeau is a very, very good S&C coach and just a general coach, decent coach as well. I mean, you'll find all of their sort of websites. Christian Thibodeau's is thibarmy.com. I don't know if he's got a podcast or not, but I know he's been on several podcasts. Uh, Pavel Satsula, and you can usually find him through Strong First. That's his, his company. When it comes to obviously Mike Boyle and Anthony Renner, just strength, uh, strength coach podcast, you'll find them on there. Um, if you're then looking at obviously Charles Poliquin, it was the strength sensei. I'm not sure what's gone on with that now, but just Google Charles Poliquin, you'll find all that sort of stuff. Uh, Dr. Fred Hatfield, just Google Dr. Fred Hatfield or Dr. Squat, and you will find so many good books and resources from him. I remember he did a great book with uh, Dr. Michael Yesis. Mike, Dr. Michael Yesis is still alive. If you're interested in sprinting, go to YouTube, type in Dr. Yesis, Y-E-S-S-I-S-S. -S -S. Honestly, it's amazing stuff. Dr. Michael Yesis, brilliant stuff on there. Cool. Um, then when it comes to Mike Isratel, uh, he's recently written a book, a newer book on the scientific principles of hypertrophy training, I believe it's called. Obviously go on to Dr. Mike's YouTube, Renaissance Periodization. You'll find some great info there. Dave Tate, Table Talk Podcast. You'll find all that information too. And then Juggernaut Training Systems, which was the other one I mentioned, because they, they all offer so much information for free. They try and give a lot back, which is something that, again, like we try and do. We try and give as much information back as we can, because it's about helping people move forwards and not necessarily make the mistakes that we've made. Yeah. And some people listen, some people don't, but that's the nature of the beast, isn't it? We don't know. But we don't know, unfortunately. Yeah, I heard of Pavel in uh, Tools of Titans and in an interview with Joe Rogan, in which he yeah, yes. the yeah, yeah, yeah. of a uh, strong grip and a strong core. And like, all you need to do is strong grip and strong core. Like, 
he was like emphasizing these two aspects. While all the others, I don't know many of them. I mean, I, I know about them and not that much, but all of them have got uh, articles on T Nation. Yes. Yeah, yes, I believe, they, yeah, I believe they all have actually. Yeah, I think you're correct. Yeah. T Nation is a great blog, in my opinion. And so, by the way, where can people they can find you on uh, social media? Oh, uh, social media, you'll find my bitterness and cynicism on Instagram. Okay. Uh, that's at RossFitPT10. Um, I also run a group on Facebook, which is just filled with lifters, to be fair, just people to try and sort of share information. Okay. And that's called Gains Central. That's Gains with an S and then Central, like Central Station. Feel free to come and add yourselves in there. Just, it, just ask questions. We just try and get people talking. Um, yeah, you find most of my stuff just from my Instagram handle or Ross Fit Personal Training. You'll usually find most of the things I put on. That's the same as the, the blog I run as well as the um, uh, Facebook page I have, it's just Ross Fit Personal Training. But if people have any got any questions or they're like, you said something, but I didn't get what you meant, like, just find me across a question. I'll happily answer it for you. And hopefully at some point I'll remember what the third thing was from that Russian programming. That's going to annoy me now because I'm still, I'm still, I'm still sat here thinking you've got waviness of load specialized variety and the third one's just not there i don't know if it's to do with volume reduction because they say that every few weeks you need to reduce the volume by about 60 percent mm. but, but i know it's not that i just cannot remember what this third thing was i'll have to google it and when i google it i'll be like oh for god's anyway, sake i'll put i'll put in the description like all the all our pages of this in Mm. of this in conver conversation so if you remembered about it just text me it in there. On the I've, I wonder if it's on my my search history oh, just let me have a look okay because that, that is going to annoy me if I don't find it but yeah the article was on breaking muscle I'm always positive of that I said I will I will find it and I will send it to you. I'll send it to you on Instagram and just be like, oh, here was, <laughs> here's what it was. Okay, perfect. So, Ross, thank you very much for your time and for your knowledge and uh, hope you like this conversation. And have a great yeah, it's, it's always good. Always good to have a chat with somebody who's got like a similar interest. Yeah, any questions from anyone, just have them fire over and I'll happily answer them. Perfect. All the best. Have a great day. Take care of yourself, buddy. Yeah.